Today I am irradiating some ordinary table salt, specifically with neutrons. Why? I needed sodium 24 as a high energy gamma emitter for another experiment and irradiating table salt creates another element. Hmm? For this we need just regular sodium chloride and the Ultima gold liquid scintillation cocktail. This salt is placed in our neutron source receiving a good dose of radiation therapy. The neutron flux amounts to about 10 million neutrons per second per centimeter squared. What we obtain is still radioactive but so weak that neither the contamination monitor nor the dose rate meter can detect it. What kind of nuclear reactions occur during the irradiation process? Sodium naturally exists only as sodium 23. Through an N gamma reaction it transforms into sodium 24. The neutron capture cross section for this stands at 0.44 bounds with thermal neutrons. Although not particularly high, this reaction still occurs significantly over several weeks of irradiation. Chlorine from sodium chloride exists in the form of chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. The chlorine 35 can also undergo an N gamma reaction turning into chlorine 36, which has a half life of 300,000 years and has no gamma line which is quite unusual. The neutron capture occurs with a cross section of 43.7 bounds. However, this chlorine might also undergo a different nuclear reaction called an NP reaction where one neutron goes in and one proton comes out. This reaction produces sulfur 35 from chlorine 35 and this has a cross section of 0.44 bounds. Sulfur here is rather special as the sodium chloride does not contain any sulfur. There Therefore all sulfur present in the samples is radioactive sulfur 35. This is so called carrier free. So a radionuclei present in a material without any non radioactive atoms of its kind in the sample. Thus what we end up with are radioisotopes of sodium, chlorine and even sulfur. We will measure all this in the liquid scintillation counter and on the Geely. For the LSC liquid scintillation measurement 100 mg of this sample will be combined with the ultimate gold liquid scintillation cocktail while the rest is placed onto the Geely for measurement. The gamma spectrum shows distinct high energy peaks of sodium 24 at 1368 and 2754 kilo electron volts. But where is the chlorine 38? It should have prominent gamma lines at 2167 kilo electron volts with an occurrence probability of 44% and another gamma line at 1642 kilo electron volts. To explain the absence of chlorine 38 in the spectrum I would like to calculate how much sodium 24 we got in the sample. From the region of interest of the 1368 kilo electron volt peak we can display that the background corrective activity amounts to 0.4 becquerels. I've explained how to do this in another video. Keep in mind that the efficiency of the Geely at 1368 kilo electron volts is approximately 0.7%. So the actual sodium 24 activity is approximately 57 becquerel. However, there are factors that result in much less chlorine 38 activity. Due to the isotopic abundance of chlorine 37 compared to sodium 23, only one fourth as many atoms can be activated. Thus, about 57 divided by 4. The half-life ratio of chlorine 38 to sodium 24 is 1 to 22.5. So only a 22.5 of the activity can be achieved. The gamma line's occurrence probability is 44% and 32% not 99.99 like with the sodium. And these lines are higher in energy than the 1300 lines of sodium 24. This means that the detector has an efficiency for these gamma lines of even less than 0.7%. Hence we almost see no chlorine 38 as only minimal amounts are formed. At least the cross sections for both elements were equal otherwise the calculations would have been much longer. Sorry. We can also examine the escape lines of the 2167 kilo electron volt line. Also potassium 40 is present almost everywhere and annihilation radiation at 511 kilo electron volts. In the beta spectrum we can detect other products of our radiation that don't have gamma lines such as sulfur 35 and chlorine 36 or at least we should. The low energy signal is definitely sulfur 35 however the x axis energy here is somewhat exponentially. This benefits for high resolution in the low energy range where we would not have seen the sulfur otherwise 
but this means that chlorine 36 and sodium 24 overlap. Since the measurement series has a four hour gap between the blue and the red lines, it cannot be chlorine 38 directly. We've measured it this way. Two hours of our sample been measured, then two hours of background and then two hours of our sample are measured again. If this was chlorine 38, the red line would have represented eight half-lives of chlorine 38. In short, this would have been way down at the bottom. However, it isn't. And we have already established that there are only trace amounts of chlorine 38 present. With a half-life of 14 hours, this decay fits quite well the sodium 24. To confirm this, we'd have to fit this decay and see what slope this fit has. If it were chlorine 36, which primarily accounts for this peak, there shouldn't be any decay detected. We did that and the result is 25.49 hours. That's a bit higher than 14 hours. Why? Of course, we have trace amounts of sulfur 35 and chlorine 36 in the sample. Both have compared to sodium 24 an absurdly long half-life. Traces of 300,000 years will skew the average way up. And that's it. That's an interesting way to make an ordinary, otherwise unremarkable table salt a bit more intriguing. With radioactivity, we created an entirely new element that wasn't present in the material before irradiation. And now it didn't smell like sulfur, only trace amounts were generated, which couldn't even be chemically detected. A special thanks goes to the Working Group of Analytics and Fundamental Nuclear Chemistry from Dr. Erik Strupp and the Division of Nuclear Chemistry at the University of Cologne and to my Patreons. And with that being said, goodbye!